Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you in March of 2024 with another edition of Questions for Corbett, that regular series where you send in the questions and I provide the answers. And this week, we're going to turn to an interesting and contentious topic that arises from time to time in the CorbettReport.com comment section and in correspondence I receive, etc. What am I talking about? Well, let's take a... Let's... Let's delve into this issue. Uh, first of all, by heading to the March open thread, um, which is, of course, now open and available for Corporate Report members to come in and comment. And there is a, a lively and active discussion in there, as always. But today we're going to start with a comment that's come in recently from Slow Cured Anarcho Hippie, who writes, I've recently been called anti-Semitic and was told I was falling for the false doctrine of replacement theology because I don't believe what is being perpetrated in Gaza by the modern secular state of Israel can be justified, either biblically or in any other way. By a pastor of my church? Who knew? I miss the old days when I was just accused of being a crazy conspiracy theorist. Indeed, well, as you might imagine, slow-cured anarcho-hippie, uh, I receive a bit of that kind of feedback myself, but not just from that perspective, also from its diametric opposite. So, what am I talking about? Well, for example, here's just some recent things that have come in th uh, in the mailbag. For example, I had this in recently from Joan, who writes, You are one of the very best sources of truthful and astute alternative information, and I listen to all of your podcasts. I have been waiting patiently or impatiently, since October 7th, for you to expose mainstream lies about Israel and the current genocide, long history of oppression, etc. Other than a few words right after October 7th, there has been almost nothing from you. Why are you remaining silent while two million Palestinians are being starved and genocided in the worst genocide in human history, supported as usual with Western weapons and propaganda? I thought better of you. Please explain. If I don't hear an explanation... I will sadly have to conclude you are not the man I thought you were. Thank you for the feedback, Joan. I have stuff to say about that, but let's contrast that with feedback that I got, for example, recently from Mike, uh, who writes, Please, loose, you seeming increasing anti... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, you got, <laughs> you got to proofread this. Please, loose, you seeming increasing anti-Semitic slant, despite your sidekick being very anti-Semitic. I was enjoying your recent fake news awards broadcast until you erroneously asserted events were fake that can easily be proven occurred. Were you there? Whom will you answer to someday? The Elohim of Yisrael or some other made-up L in your mind? Well, okay, thank you for that feedback, but let's contrast that to feedback I received recently from Juliana. For a moment there, I thought your work was an oasis in a very, very f***ed up reality. Then it came the genocide on steroids unleashed and your silence. Now you're just another one in the disappointment trash can. <laughs> such, such eloquent verbiage here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Uh, let's contrast that, for example, for, from this uh, to this feedback, which I received recently from Bruce. I couldn't help wondering if you had to overcome a bit of Jew Jewophobia to participate in an interview with Efret Fenixen that I posted up a while back. Uh, sorry, but I have noticed that 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 can occasionally color your work in perhaps subtle ways. What can... Oh, Jewophobia? Okay. All right, thank you for that, Bruce. Uh, also, Bannon, who writes, in light of your clear avoidance in tackling the obvious tar largest issue of our current time, the Israeli genocide of Palestinians, I have decided to withdraw my support to your platform. All right, thank you for that, Bannon. And, uh... Oh, let's go for one more, this time uh, from Corporate Report member The Lilac Dragonfly, who recently left some feedback on Israel and the Hannibal Directive, which you'll remember from New World Next Week last November. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the comment section, you will note that uh, very recently she left some feedback here. Um, the title of this episode has troubled me for months. I kept it open to someday say something about it but I still don't know exactly what to say to fully express how serious and sobering it is to me. To use the name of the nation G-D chose to reveal himself to humanity and whose men, bracket prophets, he chose to write down his messages, which people around the world claim to believe are words from G-D himself and to turn it into the place many of us believe in a place, <laughs> is a place of everlasting punishment to those who reject the same G-D. Dot, dot, dot. Well, to say the least, it shows to me a serious lack of respect and regard for the G-D of Israel. 
This is how he describes himself many, many times throughout Tanakh, and the people he chose to be a set-apart people for himself and his inheritance. The word Israel means a prince with G hyphen D. It happens me, it saddens me deeply to read the distortion of the name G hyphen D gave to Yaakov, Jacob, and by which Yaakov's descendants came to be known in the title of this episode. Very troubling indeed. I just watched this interview at the following link, which I post here, although since this episode is three months old, probably few will ever see and fewer will bother to listen. And you can go and follow that link if you are so inclined. Um, some interesting feedback to that comment, for example, Slow Cured and Narco Hippie, um, does point out, well, if you are a Christian, at any rate, you might want to reread Matthew 23 to see what uh, the Bible says about the idea of people claiming the authority of um, the God of Israel in order to uh, command others and what Jesus himself had to say about that might not be what you're thinking it, it was. Um, at any rate, um, also some interesting feedback from others. For example, Gavin M. pointing out, well, okay, yes, certainly we should not disgrace the holy name of, uh, of a people that's very disrespectful. So, of course, we will refer to the, uh, Turtle Island, not not Canada, not the United States. It's not what it's called. It's Turtle Island, right? And you wouldn't disrespect those people's religion, would you? Etc. Etc. So there's some interesting back and forth here in the comments on that particular comment. But anyway, that's just to show the type of feedback that I receive on a regular basis. And obviously so. It is a, a large and ongoing issue of what is happening in Gaza right now. But I will start my response to this question. Is it a question? I'm not sure. But at any rate, I will start my response today by pointing out, as I had cause to point out in Questions for Corbett number 100, isn't it weird how people always start their, their accusation, their finger pointing with, you never talk about, you're totally silent about, you, you've, you've kept your mouth shut on this issue, what are you avoiding, why won't you say anything, James, when that is demonstrably, provably untrue. Of course, this whole thing, all, every bit of it, all stinks to high heaven. Zionist terrorist false flag events amplified by feds and talking heads. Nepo baby Jamie Lee Curtis shared a sad photo saying, terror from the skies, until she realized she was sharing a photo of Israelis bombing Palestinians. Post deleted. One case in point that everyone's seen by now, and the Grey Zone, for example, has this story up. The source of the dubious beheaded babies claim is, drumroll please, settler leader who incited riots to wipe out Palestinian village. And this is the source that was unquestioningly parroted by the, uh, I believe, I-24 reporter, and then got picked up by Netanyahu and Biden, etc., etc. So this is how this kind of atrocity propaganda and propaganda generally starts to spread very quickly. As I'm sure you've seen, many people have been calling this Israel's 9-11. And I want to say, okay, let's take that statement. But let's not take it at face value, because of course the face value reading of that statement is that uh, just like on 9-11, we, we were attacked out of the blue uh, by these dastardly terrorists, and thus that gives us carte blanche to go on a never-ending war against anyone we don't like, right? That's the sentiment that is obviously being called to mind when they they call this Israel's 9-11. But let's, let's take it from the conspiracy reality perspective, that of course 9-11 was not some random attack out of the blue, um, and it was not by random terrorists. But wait, who is Hamas and where did they come from? As is openly and totally acknowledged, and no one denies this, Hamas was brought into existence with the support of Israel, who brought Hamas into existence as a countermeasure, as a way of, of trying to keep Yasser Arafat contained. Well, that worked stunningly, didn't it? And oh my God, who could have imagined now Hamas is this force that is capable of this incredible surprise attack? Who could have seen it coming? Israel's military received orders to shell Israeli homes and even their own bases as they were overwhelmed by Hamas militants on October 7th. How many Israeli citizens said to have been burned alive were actually killed by so-called friendly fire? I think a good summary from uh, Mark Crispin Miller, who I know you've been citing a lot on Morning Monarchy, Netanyahu's two genocides, 
talking about how the is well uh, as he says in the sub subhead here israelis know that he let hamas slaughter them in furtherance of the vast depopulation effort started by the vaccination drive dictated by his globalist cohorts so i think that's a pretty good summary of the situation and somehow in the long ignoble career of unconvicted war criminal benjamin netanyahu from his new mech nuclear smuggling to his admissions about 9-11 to his drawn-out criminal prosecution for bribery and corruption, he has managed to find a way to sink even lower. October 7th in the Hannibal Directive. Beheaded babies. An evil terrorist headquarters under a hospital. It's all fair game, right? Israel's 9-11 indeed. Two days of public hearings in South Africa's genocide case against Israel started at the International Court of Justice, ICJ, last week as pro-Palestine campaigners hope the World Court might halt Israel's devastating military campaign in Gaza. I think it speaks to the, the real change in reporting and narrative that has taken place in the past decade, specifically since Operation Protective Edge in 2014. I remember when we were covering that on New World Next Week a decade ago, we were talking about there is a change that is taking place in reporting. And for the first time ever, they would talk, at least mention some of the atrocities that were taking place that Israel was committing. At least 112 Palestinians were killed and more than 750 others were injured after Israeli troops opened fire on civilians gathered at a convoy of food trucks southwest of Gaza City, Palestinian health officials said. And James, I'm with you on this one. It's beyond this is a genocide that is being perpetrated on the Palestinian people. No, this is a holocaust. This is a holocaust of the Palestinian people that is going on in Gaza right now. And it is absolutely disgusting. In any just universe, Netanyahu would be in chains sitting before a tribunal for war crimes right now, being prepared to be sentenced for crimes against humanity. And those are just the examples that occur off the top of my head where Gaza and the Israel situation was literally the title story that was being covered there. But I have also, for example, on New World Next Week, we covered the uh, Israel bombs areas of southern Gaza when where it told Palestinians to flee war cr crime atrocity story um, and others besides. So the idea you never talk about is flatly blatantly, demonstrably untrue. And, of course, when you point this out to the people who accuse you, why are you so silent? It would be, well, you're not talking about it enough. <laughs> Which, again, is the unwinnable argument. I'm not playing that game. Um, anyway, people can decide to watch or not watch or listen or not listen to anything I do at any time. That's completely their prerogative. But it is 100% and totally my prerogative that I... I have always adhered to and will always adhere to, I talk about whatever I want, whenever I want to, in whatever way I want. I compromise for nobody. I make no, no, I, I don't talk about something or not talk about something because anybody says anything or, or intimidates me or, or threatens, oh, I'll withdraw my support. I don't care. Do what you're going to do and I will do what I'm going to do. And you wouldn't want it any other way. But anyway, that's just... To put that on the record, no, I am not silent and I'm not uh, avoiding any issues. Um, having said that, I have and continue to and will continue to call out genocide, holocaust, atrocities, when and if and as I see them, as exactly as I have done repeatedly with regard to the ongoing unfolding tragedy in Gaza right now. And I make no bones about that. I I will not carve out any exception or space for any issue or for any... Uh, uh, morality applies completely across the board to every human being. Every human moral agent is subject to the same moral code, and I call it the exact same way for absolutely everyone on the planet. So anyone, anyone whatsoever, anywhere on the planet who advocates the killing, harming, starving submission of innocent civilians because, well, we got to get to some bad guys over there. And trust me about that bad guys part. It, it, it is not in the realm of moral conversation and does not, cannot be included in such a conversation. Um, so that, that I think goes something to the heart of this issue is that 
people do carve out a special exception space for Israel and what is happening in occupied Palestine um, what, on both sides of the issue. Uh, in fact, it has been observed, if you're getting flack, you, then you know you're over the target. Well, I have often taken it as a, a, a sort of badge that I'm getting flack, not just from one side of the issue, but from both. You're a neo-Nazi anti-Semite for daring to question what is the Israeli government and military is doing in Palestine, James. No, you're, you're, a, a, you're part of the Jewish conspiracy. You're covering up the Jewish conspiracy, James, because you don't name the Jew. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me name the Jew. I name him Josh. <laughs> Just nonsense. Anyway, I, I, I'm happy for extremist, zealot, zany, racist, horrible people on both sides of this extreme issue to be angry at me. That's how I know I am actually over the target. Um, having said that, there's, I mean, there's so much to articulate with regards to this. So I was very glad, actually, recently to have the opportunity to articulate this. I had a, an interesting forum uh, in which to talk about these issues, specifically the Truth News podcast video show that is hosted by Shai Silberman, an Israeli, an Israeli conspiracy realist who has talked to David Icke and others before. Um, he, he runs a Hebrew uh, truth channel. Uh, on Rumble, which I'll link up in the show notes. Um, and he has conducted interviews, for example, with David Icke in English and then subtitles them in Hebrew. Uh, he recently had the chance to conduct an interview with me, which has not been posted yet. I believe it's still in the, he's still doing the subtitles. Um, but I do have the, the recording. So I'm going to play just a section of that interview where he was asking me about uh, this issue and bringing it up in the, uh, I think, a reasonable and and calm way and letting me have my my uh, space to talk about it. So I'm very appreciative of that uh, that type of forum. And so I'm going to play a little bit of this just to put this idea, this context uh, into its proper place so that we can understand this issue and where I'm coming from on it a little bit better. Okay, so now uh, uh, that idea brings us to the next question. Um, I've been watching you and James uh, with uh, for Media Monarchy for a long time. I've noticed that there's like a voice that you keep talking uh, in that sounds, I, I wouldn't say anti-Semitic, but when you keep saying Israel is doing this, Israel is doing that. In the case of Israel, unlike when you say uh, U.S. government and, and U.S. Uh, citizens, it's two different p things. It, it seems like when you talk about Israel, it's it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. The government, the people, they're all the same. And I want you to first clarify uh, on that and then... Give your take on on what happened in October seventh uh, of last year and the whole war that's going on and developing from your perspective as an outsider, and uh, how does Israel play into the globalist agenda? Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address that. But might I posit that the reason that you hear what I say about Israel differently than the way that you hear what I say, for example, about America is because you are Israeli. So I understand why it would sound different, but I, I, I would suggest even listening back to what we've already talked about today, when I refer to the American empire as the most dangerous, tyrannical, um, world bestriding empire that's ever existed, I didn't take the time to distinguish between the American government and the American people. I take it for granted that people will understand that I'm referring to the American government and the forces that are puppeteering it as, uh, w again, we've already talked about, people think of this as a nation state sort of playing uh, chessboard, what have you. Uh, it, it is not. It is a transnational group of elites or elitists, really, who uh, presume to control this grand chessboard and who manipulate the different pieces on it. So that is my fundamental view of reality. This is not about nation states. And so I... I, I apologize for sloppy speaking if I come across in the sense that I am talking about Israel as every single person in the state of Israel. Um, but in the exact same way, when I refer to America or Canada or Japan or any other country on the planet, I am almost without fail, unless specified otherwise, talking about their governments and more realistically, the forces that are puppeteering those governments. So that is the, the way that I envision what is happening. And Personally, my moral framework is that, as I have already stated, 
individual human sovereignty is the ultimate basis of my moral philosophy. And that applies to absolutely everyone of every skin pigmentation and racial background and religious uh, adherence and everything else. Uh, the moral precepts are part of natural law and they pertain to all humans at all times, in all places, no exceptions, period. So I like to think that I have absolutely no particular dog in any particular fight of any nation state against any other nation state or any ethnicity against any other ethnicity or any religious group against any other religious group, I think the same moral principles always apply. As to October 7th and what happened there, uh, I did, for example, try to lay this out in a conversation that I recorded with uh, Ryan Christian of Last American Vagabond shortly after the events, which unfortunately there were audio issues with that, so I know people had a, a difficulty literally hearing um, that conversation, but essentially uh, being a conspiracy realist and one who has spent a significant amount of time over the past two decades researching various terrorist quote-unquote events, uh, my red, al red alert sirens are firing on all cylinders with this miraculous, incredible breach of one of the most heavily defended borders on the planet, as you know, um, on that date. And I think that, again, from my outside perspective, and not someone who has the, the personal experience of living there, I find it extremely unlikely that the events took place in the way that we are being asked to believe that they took place. Um, what ulti My ultimate takeaway from this is that Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likudniks are as you know, in a precarious or have been in a precarious political situation for in recent years and facing mounting political pressures, um, which evaporate um, as people rally around the flag in the event of a catalyzing and catastrophic event. And being a North American, my obvious parallel to this and what I experienced in my political coming of age on 9-11 was exactly what happened with the neocons in power in Washington in on 9-11-2001. They went from being the laughing stock hated by many people to being, you cannot say anything bad about the government. And I think that was at the very least the attempt. That was probably part of the calculation of what was happening on October 7th. Whether this was a completely staged and engineered event, something allowed to happen, something in between, um, at any rate, I think that the idea is that this would be the type of event that would uh, get people, again, rallying around the flag and rallying around the government. And I think it has not had that effect. I think, as you can see, there's still obviously a lot of political um, turmoil in Israel. But I, from my outside perspective, that would be the way that I would frame this as, if not an outright false flag, at least a highly suspicious event that is being used for political purposes. Okay. Uh, well, I see that we have uh, nine minutes and a half left, so we'll make it as short as possible. I guess I turned it on a little bit too soon. Um, in Israel, for example, the conspiracy realists, uh, we have a lot of things more than just thinking about it. There were like people dressed up in uh, blue shirts running around giving instruction and they looked white. I mean, they didn't look Arab. We saw videos of uh, the terrorists coming in and some of them were speaking in English, some of them were speaking in Russian. And not all of them were Arabs, obviously. And when they start bringing back some of the uh, abducted people, you could see that the, one of the, uh, the the whole scene was weird. And one of those uh, um, uh, terrorists was appeared to be like physically a woman. And they were talking to a kid, and he was like, "Oh yes, yes, okay." And it was like very nice. They were helping an old woman get out on the truck, and it's completely different than what you expect from terrorists. So we have our own theory that it was a very, very big false flag being conducted and run by the government or government agencies or whatever. We have a lot of information running around in our um, pr private networks and of, of uh, conspiracy realists. So if you want more information on that, I can give you. Um, so how, what's your take on the whole, um, again, back to the, the point of uh, Israel and Palestine, because uh, I've also heard you and James talk about that too, and it seems you're a little too, uh, let's say, media-oriented, like, oh, Israel is bad, they're taking uh, Palestinian land, but in our view, we came into our land, I mean, as people, that's what we were told, and we, we lived here 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and the Arabs are actually, and historically, are new here, so this whole 
Palestinian-Israeli um, war is actually conducted from the top, as far as I can see, that they created this to make this war and, and, and do all this mess just so they can control us. Because the whole thing that happens in this war now is at the same time, they, they have like a big, big, uh, uh, a lot of buildings are being, are being built, a lot of houses, a lot of uh, buildings with apartments, and they're starting to shrink the country and change everything. And they're creating the 15-minute cities on one hand, on the other hand, dividing the country back to Palestine and Israel. So I think there's a little bit more than just, you know, who's who's right here. And just want to hear your opinion about that. And we'll close with that. We have like seven minutes. All right. Well, again, I think this ultimately comes down to a uh, property, property issues. And uh, if uh, certainly if there is a, a, a deed or a title on the land from 2000 or 3000 years ago, everyone would love to see it. Of course, that does not exist. So now we get into historical narratives about people's right to exist in a certain patch of land, etc., which is going to be incredibly contentious and that a Canadian in Japan is not going to solve <laughs> for the people of Israel <laughs> in the next six minutes. Um, having said that, I certainly don't believe that this is a straightforward and obvious um, uh, encroachment on Israeli land by Palestinians, I would say that um, the historical record speaks to the opposite of the past 50 to 60 years. Of course, then again, when do you start the clock on something like this? Do you start the clock in 2000 BC, or do you start it in 1948, or do you start it in 1967, or do you start it on October 7th, 2022, and you'll, or, sorry, 2023, and you will get different results every single time, depending on where you start that clock, and which narrative uh, you're, you're uh, uh, subscribing to in those competing, contesting claims. Um, again, I'm not going to solve this in the next five minutes, but I personally, I think that the uh, the tide of historical and world opinion is turning against the idea that Israel is the poor put upon um, aggressees in this conflict, and that they are somehow beholden to this overwhelming team of barbarian hordes at their gates, which is the way that it has been framed my the entirety of my life, um, certainly in the in the Western media that I grew up with in Canada and the American media that I consumed, that was the way it was always portrayed. Uh, I think that perception is starting to change and people are finally being allowed to at least question that historical narrative without being, well, still being called anti-Semitic for questioning that narrative. But I think that the power of that particular epithet is uh, waning um, as uh, Human Rights Watch comes out and, and calls Israel an apartheid state. And the International Court of Justice is now uh, telling uh, Israel it has to refrain from genocidal actions in Gaza. And country after country is um, t speaking to the International Court of Justice, giving its own opinion with the vast majority of countries now on the side uh, that Israel is committing a genocide in Gaza, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, uh, I find it interesting that even um, the Washington Post and BBC Verify and others are calling out the IDF for its propaganda with regards to, for example, to the terrorist mastermind headquarters that were supposedly under the Al-Shifa um, hospital that the IDF has not provided any substantive proof for, as the Washington Post puts it. So there is a tidal change that is occurring, and I take that as the reflection of a sort of societal discourse that is changing. As people may or may not know, I don't take any of those organizations or those bodies, the International Court of Justice or Human Rights Watch or BBC Verify or any of those establishment propaganda outlets at face value, but I think it does represent a sort of change that is taking place, at least in the narrative that um, is happening. And part of that, I I think is reflective of the fact that we now have access to technologies that um, allow people to broadcast and 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 communicate freely to others around the world instantaneously. So, for example, we can see the incredible lengths that France and others are going to to try to drop supplies into Gaza um, and failing to do so in some cases with, for example, yesterday's uh, air shipment falling mostly into the sea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can now actually see that happening, whereas it wouldn't have even been reported on in Western media in the gatekeeping 20th century um, uh, paradigm of of that media. So I, I think there is a, just a different historical discourse that's happening right now. I am attempting to report on that, um, that change in perspective that is enabled by this technology and what is happening with regards to the, the dissemination of this information. And I, as always, I, I, again, I, I want to make it very, very specific that I think that the 
probably the primary victims of the Israeli government are the Israeli people. And I think that was manifested quite obviously over the course of the scandemic, for example, with the Israeli population being turned into pincushions um, for big pharma and, and all of their medical intervention nonsense that, uh, that has been inflicted around the world was inflicted on Israelis first and hardest. So I understand that it's not, I certainly don't think that it's the Israeli people that are part of this this cabal, it is, in fact, they are in some ways in the front line of what is being inflicted on them by their own government, as I think every nation and every state is. Um, but when we put it in this, again, in the context of this nation state, nation state conflict, etc., cetera, um, then we start to, as if we're going to take sides and this government and this military is doing the right thing. Again, I think it comes down to human, individual human sovereignty and anyone on any side of any conflict who thinks that it is okay to inflict suffering and or death on innocent civilians has not entered the plane of moral communication and deserves to be, I think, excluded from that conversation. Once again, that's Shai Silberman of the Truth News Podcast. Once again, that will be linked in the show notes uh, for this edition of Questions for Corbett at corporatereport.com slash QFC hyphen Israel Palestine. And Uh, There you will also find all of the links to all of the things that we're talking about in that conversation and everything else that I'm citing today um, as some very important show notes, so I hope you will check those out. I should also note that that conversation was being recorded before uh, the Flower Massacre occurred, so I didn't address it because it hadn't happened yet. Um, I presumably would have if it had happened at the time we were recording that conversation. But I I am, again, quite appreciative of Shai for giving me the space and forum to talk presumably to an Israeli audience, about these issues, which I think is important. And to put on record, yes, no, I can't carve out absolutely no special, exceptionary space for any for anyone, um, Israeli, Palestinian, or otherwise, any people, um, to commit genocide or slaughter or starvation or anything else in the name of getting some terrorist boogeyman that was created by the governments and intelligence agencies in the first place. But that's exactly the point. The way that I see reality and have always seen reality is that it is billions of average people who are being warred upon by their own governments, the Israeli people being warred upon by the Israeli government, no exception. Prime example, the biosecurity nonsense of the scamdemic era in which, as I pointed out to Shai Silberman, yes, it's 100% the case that the Israeli people were at the front lines of the being the human pincushions for Big Pharma and getting the experimental mRNA nonsense clot shot garbage um, faster and harder and at least as strongly as anywhere else on the planet. And uh, I think that's a good indication that, yes, the Israeli people are the victims of their own government. Uh, So... I, I, I let me say again for Shai Silberman or other Israelis or Jews who perceive that I talk differently about the way is the Israeli government and the IDF are committing war crimes in Gaza than I do about the way the American military is committing war crimes or the American intelligence agencies are um, subverting human rights or anything else or um, Russians or Chinese or Japanese or anything else. No, I carve out absolutely no exception. It's all the same. And no, I don't, every single time I talk about something, I don't take the time to make that distinction. Well, I'm not talking about the Israeli people. I'm talking about Israel. No, I do not make that distinction when I'm talking about any country. And so I don't make that distinction when it comes to Israel either. Um, But it is there. If you are a Jew, if you are a Muslim, if you are a Christian, if you are a agnostic or assorted other or anyone else of any religious affiliation, any creed, any background, any sexual identity or anything else who realizes the structure of the power pyramid and the very few elitists at the top who are trying to engineer us into this eugenicist technocratic system where we are human cattle that are being herded towards the inevitable slaughter and the depopulation culling. If you understand that reality, then arm in arm, we are allies and you are my ally and we are going to go forward together. Um, we may disagree on this or that thing, but if we have that and we adhere to the same basic moral principles and fundaments, then you're my ally, and I make no distinctions on that. Um, that's that's the base reality of what I see. And so, might I posit, um, 
first of all, I think <laughs> neo-Nazis who think I'm going to start supporting Hitler and the great national socialist government <laughs> that he brought about, and yes, we should kill all the Jews. Um, I, I have absolutely no idea why on earth you would think I would support any of that, because it's 100% anathema to everything I believe and everything I've ever said. But also to Jewish people and Israelis and Zionists who aren't Jewish or Israeli, who for some reason think that I'm also, I'm just going to blindly support whatever Israel is doing in the name of whatever, some religious fundament or something. Well, uh, that's not the case either. No, I, I adhere to moral principles and I make no exceptions for them. I might also suggest that it probably isn't very helpful um, for people to go around calling people like James Corbett a Jewophobe. And oh, you must have had to overcome your Jewophobia to talk to that Israeli person, James, which is just such nonsense. It so completely does not correspond to anything I have ever said or thought that it seems that it's almost an attempt to get people who would be your allies to not be your allies. It's very, very strange. Having said all of that, that's a lot of verbiage to say what I think James M. Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com said extremely perfectly in the last edition of New World Next Week something that I very much endorse. And I think what they don't want to hear, certainly my, my message is not popular at all. I don't hate Jews at all. I don't hate trans people at all. I hate the state and their eugenics agenda. That might be really dangerous to, you know, a lot of their uh, works they've got planned. James Evan Pilato, MediaMonarchy.com. Bang on the button with that one. And that's my take. So there it is. And I will continue to call out genocide and Holocaust and continue to report objectively and continue, no doubt, to anger extremists on all sides of these issues. But that's what I'm here for. And you can watch or not watch. And that's completely your prerogative. You might have things to say about this issue as well. So if you do, well, I invite you to take part in the active and interesting comment section, no doubt, for this particular edition of the Corbett Report at corbettreport.com slash QFC hyphen Israel Palestine. Get in and uh, join the conversation. I'm sure there's a lot to be said about this, but I'm going to leave it here for today. As always, I'd like to once again stress all of the things that I talked about and mentioned and cited will be in the show notes for this edition of uh, questions for Corbett, so please do go there and add to corporatereport.com and delve into the sources and see, continue exploring this very interesting topic. But that's going to do it for today. I'm James Corbett at corporatereport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again in the near future. <laughs>